everybody, and welcome to Project HR, a podcast dedicated to building better workplaces. Project HR is brought to you by Projections, an IRI company. IRI helps organizations navigate workplace challenges, improve employee engagement and productivity, manage labor relations, and implement effective communication strategies to achieve their goals. For more information, you can visit Projections online at projectionsinc.com. I am Jennifer Oroqua, Director of Business Development for IRI, and your host for today's episode of Project HR. For years, there's been a debate within learning and development circles regarding the topic of microlearning. Even the very definition of what it is has been open for discussion. Despite this debate, or perhaps because of it, microlearning has become a buzzword in workplace learning. And today, I'm joined by J.D. Dillon, who can hopefully get us some clarity on this topic. J.D. is the Chief Learning Architect for Exonify, a software company focusing on learning solutions for frontline employees. He's also the principal and founder of LearnGeek, an insights advising and education group developed to encourage organizations to reimagine their approach to learning. J.D., it's great to have you here on Project HR. Uh, Thanks, Jennifer. Happy to be here. Uh, Thanks for inviting me to join Project HR. Sure. So let's start by talking about microlearning. Even though it's a buzzword, it's not really a new concept, is it? What's the history there? Yeah, it's it's clearly an example of the everything old is new type situation as applied to workplace learning and development. So hmm. it, it really comes down to a couple of, of basic principles, the idea that as human beings, we can only learn so much so quickly. We can only take in, consume, and retain so much information. And unfortunately, a lot of traditional learning solutions kind of go against that idea or don't quite align with that kind of natural limitation of being a person. Mm -hmm. And then also the fact that uh, people are busy. There's not a whole lot of extra time, at least focused time within the workflow dedicated to really focusing on the knowledge and skill development people need not just to be successful today, but to be successful moving forward based on however their roles are changing or how organizational priorities are shifting. And oh my gosh, have organizational priorities shifted in the past Mm -hmm. two years? So you Mm -hmm. kind of wrap, wrap those two concepts together and try to make it something buzzy, and you've mm-hmm. got microlearning. Yeah, and I would definitely hazard a guess that there's a relationship between the rise of the smartphone and having this at our fingertips and the rise of microlearning. Would you agree? I'd say technology's definitely played a part in terms of just simply enabling access to information and, and digital resources, just like it does in our everyday lives. And then you apply just kind of the ubiquity of technology and that increased opportunity to reach people in ways that better align with their day-to-day working reality. And I think you see a a clear enabler when it comes to Mm -hmm. rethinking the way that we deliver training and realizing that. I I believe that in my experience, I found that most learning and development and HR teams know that putting a person who joined the company today in a back room for eight hours of nonstop <laughs> to click next to continue e-learning right. is a bad idea. Yeah, I don't right. think anyone's ever argued for that concept. But the the unfortunate reality is that we may have been told, hey, we hired this person because we need them right hmm. now. Hmm. You have one day or you have two days. And we also have stakeholders and subject matter experts saying before they can work, they need to know all 370 slides worth of <laughs> So we're kind of just stuck in a a bit of a conundrum, and that's what happens. So now with different types of technology, the ability to leverage mobile devices, different ways to deliver training content and different modalities, uh, kind of underneath the idea of microlearning, that's Mm -hmm. opened the door to more opportunities to reach people at the right time rather than at the times that they're permitted to quote unquote learn Mm -hmm. as part of their job. So let's dig in a little bit here. How would you define microlearning? My kind of casual definition is just learning that fits. And the idea that kind of coming back to what I said earlier, you just take basic learning science principles, the fact that we have limitations when it comes to knowledge consumption and retention, the fact that the more often we are exposed to information, the more likely we are to retain it, which is why many people of a certain age likely remember their phone numbers from when they're kids. When Mm -hmm. we're exposed to that information repeatedly, it just sticks. You remember the lyrics to certain songs because it sticks because of repeated exposure. So you apply basic learning principles like spaced repetition, retrieval practice, those types of ideas. And then the fact that that naturally matches up pretty well with the problem that people don't have time. So if we can only deliver effective learning experiences in shorter increments that match our limitations as people, and we can only deliver learning activities in the short increments people have available in terms of time on the job, that snaps together into this concept of, well, let's create learning 
opportunities that fit the realities that we face every day as employees. And that's how I explain micro learning. Interesting. And it's funny that you say that because I definitely remember my phone number from when I was like eight. <laughs> and I've often mm -hmm. said that if I didn't have so many song lyrics in my head, there'd be room for other things. So, <laughs> But I love the idea that this is not just breaking learning into smaller bites for easier consumption. It, it, that's how I think I, a lot of people view micro learning. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, a lot of people started out by looking for a number. And I don't think we're there as much anymore, where if you talked about micro learning five years ago, there are a lot of people saying this is the correct duration of a video or a piece of e-learning content, what have you. And hmm. a lot of people gravitated towards the idea of, well, people's attention spans are shorter, a la TikTok and Netflix and blah, 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 mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. whatever modern day content consumption model you want to apply uh, to this context that doesn't really match this context. And the reality is that we have great attention spans as people because we pay attention to what matters. So it's not a matter of that we can't pay attention to anything, therefore content must be shorter than four minutes and 35 seconds. I've heard people get that specific, <laughs> which is really <laughs> odd, because then I ask the question, where'd you get that number? And mm -hmm. I'll hear things like, well, that's the average duration of a YouTube video. And my <laughs> reply is, why is that relevant? It doesn't, right. that has nothing to do with what we're doing here. Yeah. The Avengers Endgame film was almost three hours long and <laughs> I watched the whole thing. Yep. So they didn't need to break Avengers up into three minute increments <laughs> for me, right? But I was getting right. value. I was interested. I was engaged the entire time. Mm -hmm. That's usually the actual problem is that if you have a longer uh, digital course as an example, or maybe a classroom session, how do we keep people engaged for the amount of time? Well, the answer mm -hmm. is not break things apart because of some myth around people's attention span being shorter than a goldfish, which is a whole <laughs> nother conversation. Right. But it, it's just that if you, if you have someone's attention, the way to keep it is to deliver value. So mm. if your training content is not designed in a way to be of clear value for the entire duration, people are going to look elsewhere because we're distracted, got plenty going on around us especially if you work in a frontline environment and you're around customers who are asking questions all day in a very busy uh, workplace, or even more importantly, we have options when it comes to content. So if the training material delivered by my learning and development team doesn't quickly get to my particular need to help me solve a problem, I may turn away from that and go hunting elsewhere because I have a phone and mm -hmm. I can access the internet now. Mm -hmm. So 25 years ago, the options were very different and very limited. Now, learning and development has to meet the bar of all available information on the internet. So we have to be as engaging and as value add as that content and not worry about things like you know, artificial considerations like attention span. Because if you mm -hmm. deliver value, people will pay attention, they will engage, and they'll keep coming back. So in the introduction, we talked about the debate sur surrounding micro learning. How do we know if our our, our micro learning efforts are going to be successful? What you know, what elements go into that? What benefits are there by using micro learning? It all comes down to what's the end. Why are we having a conversation about learning at all it, around this particular topic? So if someone comes to you and given that micro learning has been a buzzy term for so long, and it's mm -hmm. it's definitely gone beyond the HR L and D circles, there are people in operational roles in a variety of industries using the word now. So it's just like any other learning tactic that we've ever experienced, where if people come to you and say, we should do some micro learning on, mm -hmm. you need to dig into why and not just say, that's a good idea, because <laughs> you're asking me for something that means I have value here. Right? It really comes down to, well, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And how did you identify that there was a problem in the first place? Because what mm -hmm. we're trying to get to is a measurable outcome. Mm -hmm. How are we going to ultimately determine if whatever we do to help someone improve their performance is actually successful? It, the entire conversation has to begin with what's the desired outcome we're trying to see in terms of business result, performance result? How mm -hmm. do we measure that? And then how do we then use that measurement to inform the strategy we're going to apply, whether it be something that we deem quote unquote micro learning or something that applies again, the same principles, because you don't need to use the word to apply the ideas, the idea that we need to fit experiences into the flow of work to make learning part of the job. We need to make sure it's the information we deliver is easy to re retain so that when it's time to apply, people are ready to do so. 
So all of those ideas work across the board when it mm -hmm. comes to designing a learning and support solution, but it really all needs to come down to what's the measurable outcome we're trying to achieve. Because we, if we don't start with that measurement in mind, mm -hmm. we're just potentially building training for the sake of training, and that doesn't help anybody. Right. For sure. You're spot on there. And we talked about technology and it being an enabler you know, for micro learning, but is there specific delivery that works best if, with, for these short bursts of learning? I mean, does it have to be digital or could you know, old school paper training type modules count? I think everything's on the table. It just comes down to what is easiest to enable access as close to the workflow as possible and at the scale and speed required. So if you are a learning and development professional, and you're supporting one work location with 40 people. Mm -hmm. That's a very different conversation than you're a learning and development team of 20 people supporting 400,000 employees mm -hmm. spread across I'm multiple sure. countries, yeah. right? So it comes down to looking at the context in which we're going to try to solve this problem and then ident kind of matching that up with, well, what's the right tactic, the right technology, the right solution to do that? And in a lot of the work that I do, it comes down to really taking a look at the workplace and let's mm -hmm. take a grocery store as an example and saying, well, what are the problems we're trying to solve in this environment? Well, maybe we're trying to improve safety outcomes in a particular department, or we're trying to improve customer service and satisfaction uh, at the cash wrap at the front of the store. Well, then we have to figure out, well, what's the right way to get the right solution to the people that we need to change behavior to improve performance? And in many cases, a, a digital solution is at least part of, if not the primary delivery mechanism, because just to scale a solution at the speed required by an organization will likely involve some technology. And then it comes mm -hmm. down to, well, how do we leverage that technology to get the solution as close to the person as possible? Because we know, let's in the grocery store, someone who works behind the deli counter, uh, that person clocks in, goes behind the deli counter, and then almost never leaves that deli counter. That's mm -hmm. where they do their job. So how do I reach that person as close as possible there and only remove them if it's absolutely required? Because removing someone from the operation damages the customer experience in a lot of cases. So one of one of my favorite examples of technology used for micro learning is that there's there's a grocery store chain out there that actually accesses learning and support content on the scale that's <laughs> in the deli. So where they weigh your meat. Uh, <laughs> there did you know deli scales are have giant touch screens and are internet capable devices. Who knew? <laughs> it, it's right. It's a great example of though taking a really good look at the workflow and the work experience and saying, mm -hmm. well, the right way to enable access to certain information, the screen's sitting right there. But mm -hmm. in other cases, maybe we're going to use personal devices or we're going to use um, a desktop computer that's located in a certain department. But making sure the technology is part of the working experience, not a computer on the second floor of the store that no one ever goes to, mm -hmm. locked behind the HR manager's door. Like that's just not part of my work experience. So what are the odds I'm going to make it part of my learning and development experience? Mm -hmm. Smart, creative solutions. I love that. All right, JD, we're going to have to take a sponsorship break right now. But when we return, I want to talk about how we can make micro learning a part of our organization's learning and support strategy. So stay with us. Creating and maintaining a solid digital employee communication strategy can seem overwhelming. But missing out on the advantages of today's tools can mean missing the mark in developing and maintaining positive employee relations. We've identified seven digital communication mistakes our clients make most often to give you a huge leap forward in your digital communication strategy. From clearly defining the intent of your communication to ensuring consistency, these practical tips are easy to implement. By avoiding mistakes like solving the wrong problem at the wrong time or not taking advantage of a variety of delivery mechanisms, you'll create a solid digital communication strategy that engages employees. Don't waste another minute on an ineffective strategy. Download your free copy of the seven digital employee communication mistakes today at projectionsinc.com slash employee dash digital dash communication. We're back with J.D. Dillon, Chief Learning Architect for Axonify and Principal and Founder of LearnGeek. Now, J.D., we first read your words on this topic in a blog post on LearnGeek, and in it, you made clear that to incorporate microlearning into our companies, we've got to consider our entire learning and development strategy. Can you walk us through why it's important to take that broader view? 
I think we have a tendency, and this isn't just L and D. This is this is kind of general workplace tendencies to put things in boxes and to identify like wh- when are we going to pull which tool out of the box at a particular moment. Mm-hmm. In learning and development, a lot of times it can be it could be social learning, it could be mobile learning, it could be micro learning, and we and we sit there and say, well, when is it the right time to use these different tools? And I believe that's not the reality we need to be working in. It's actually a blend of all of those things. So rather than think about us having these different tools, it's how do the principles underlying these different concepts or strategies inform everything we're doing within L&D? Because let's take mobile learning as the example. Hmm. Well, mobile learning isn't really about a device. It's about the idea that access to learning and support resources needs to be ubiquitous. And kind of Hmm. like we were talking about earlier, it's, I need to be able to get the resources I need using the technology I use on the job. And that's how we should apply the idea of mobile learning. So micro learning, kind of a similar idea. How do we shape our overall learning and development strategy so that it, again, fits into the reality of what people are doing on their job every day and really say, well, there are going to be times, clearly, when we need to pull people away from their jobs, away from the operation to focus on more uh, in-depth learning and development activities. The extreme example would be flying an airplane. You don't learn how to fly an airplane while you're flying an airplane (laughs) in five-minute increments, right? Right, So you do need to step away. There's formal education involved. There's simulation activity involved. And then there's a lot of checklists in the cockpit of an airplane. So, So how do you really assess each challenge and the requirements of each role and identify you know, when are the right times that we need to pull people away for more in-depth, push-oriented, kind of formal, formalized coursework? But can we make that the exception rather than the rule? And that continuous learning and support opportunity better fits as part of my job, not just in the workflow. And that's where I think micro-learning, the philosophy and the principles behind it, can help us reshape learning and development strategy. So that becomes more of a continuous part of the work and not something I need to step away from work in order to go learn. And then I fall behind because just the reality of work is that everyone's real busy and people don't have time for extra tasks unless it delivers clear value or simply fits into what I'm doing every day. So micro learning is really a component of our strategy, not the strategy itself. It's it's not a replacement for, for a larger scale learning and development program. Absolutely. Nothing goes away. I, we have a tendency also to want to say, well, we're moving away from instructor-led training and we're going to micro-learning instead. <laughs> and I honestly, okay. as someone who's been applying these principles for more than 10 years, I don't know what that means. I don't know why we have to leave anything behind. It's just that we need to shift the way that we use different tools and tactics. And I want to go back to something that you said earlier, You know, the, the fact that, that this really is an ongoing learning and development program. It's delivering training in small doses over time. It, it sort of seems to me that a variety of modalities could or should be used in any program that includes microlearning. Can you talk about that a little bit? Basically, the way I, the way I think about that is the, the modality or tactic that we use has to, again, match the working reality of the audience we're supporting. Mm-hmm. So if you're supporting, um, let's say you work in a large dynamic business and you have a variety of different personas and roles out there, and you're trying to support maybe similar skill development, but in different audiences. So maybe one of your audiences is a manufacturing team. So they Mm -hmm. spend 99% of their time on the manufacturing floor and they can't step away for extended periods because they could shut the line down if they don't have the right people in place. That reality is meaningfully different than maybe another part of your audience that is a work from home marketing team. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are certain overlapping skills that you're looking to develop. Well, the reality is that the modality used, the tactics used, likely need to shift because if I'm a member of the marketing team working from home, I'm sitting in front of a computer all day. I -hmm. probably have greater control over my schedule. I can decide, hey, I'm going to go look up some information about that particular topic that I know I need to improve on in order to be able to accomplish this project. But if you're supporting the manufacturing worker, you can't push a video maybe to that individual because they can't hear it when they're Mm -hmm. on the manufacturing Mm -hmm. floor. You need to look again at the technology that's around them and say, well, How much time do we have? Well, maybe we have three minutes from when the person clocks in to when they have to report to their their position on on the floor. Well, what can we do in those three minutes to give someone an opportunity to get exposure to new information, to practice a particular skill? 
So it, it really comes down to assessing what the day-to-day -day reality looks like and then matching that to the right modality, the right tools, tactics, and technologies so that everyone gets an equitable experience. Because that the goal shouldn't be an equal experience mm -hmm. because, again, people do very different types of work, mm -hmm. but they all deserve an equitable opportunity to be able to develop themselves. So therefore, it's on us in HR and learning and development to find ways to shape the experience around that reality, to work with our partners and stakeholders to see where we can inform the reality of day-to-day -day work to help learning and development be part of people's jobs. But ultimately, it's it's up to us to make sure we make we make that equitable experience available because end of the day, people have work to do and they have mm. to do it within that working reality. So we have to go to them rather than trying to make them come to us. And, and all that makes so much sense. I love how customized and personalized microlearning can become once we start viewing it as, as learning that fits. All right, JD, we're going to take some time out for another quick break. I'll be right back after this. You're listening to the Project HR Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Oroqua, and my guest today is J.D. Dillon, Chief Learning Architect for Exonify and Principal and Founder of LearnGeek. And we are back. So, J.D., I want to shift a little bit here. We've I've mentioned LearnGeek throughout the episode. Can you share with us a little bit about what LearnGeek is and what you do? Sure. So I, I, I work uh, kind of a, a hybrid role. So in, with Exonify, I'm, I'm enabling my technology team that's located outside of Toronto, Ontario, Canada to enable frontline employees around the world through our, our technology content and services. And then on the other side with LearnGeek, I uh, work in kind of an advisory role, I'd say, where I'll work with organizations maybe to uh, pop in to help them kind of rethink how they're shaping or evolving their learning and development strategies, or maybe in a lot of cases, I'll deliver presentations, keynote sessions, what I call kind of eye-opening sessions, because mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, and as someone who spent most of my career in corporate HR operations and learning and development, mm -hmm. I know sometimes that you're just trying to kind of get over the hill, or you're trying to get that new I figure out how that new idea is going to fit into your environment, or maybe how can you get certain stakeholders and subject matter experts, or maybe even your peer group to buy in to this mm -hmm. new idea. And I had a lot of experiences where I thought it was a great idea, <laughs> but maybe other members of my team weren't quite buying right. it because you know, it wasn't the thing I usually did or was it part of my job. So sometimes you just need someone else that they don't mm -hmm. know to come from outside the organization and just say the same thing you said, or maybe <laughs> articulate it in a different way, bringing some outside experience, you know, some stories from other organizations that have seen success in adopting these types of ideas. So in a lot of cases, as part of LearnGeek, I provide that type of support where I'll you know, come in and talk about things like microlearning or artificial intelligence applied to talent development. These a little bit newer ideas or maybe buzzy ideas to help people kind of wrap definition around them and help help organizations understand how they can apply these ideas to solve problems that they're facing and how they can do it in a way that, like I kind of said before, doesn't require throwing out the entire playbook. I see it as a, a kind of meaningful evolution of practices. And I try to find ways to help kind of kickstart that evolution with organizations. And on that note, let's talk about LearnGeek's um, biannual hype cycle for L&D trends. That sounds like a really good resource. Yeah, this was something I just started to kind of do as a lark um, because we we mentioned it earlier. I think there's a tendency to put trendy things in their own boxes and mm. never really talk about them in one visual or on one picture. And then the the other thing I, I notice is that I'm going to use giant air quotes when I throw this term out there. <laughs> Everyone okay. feel free to do this with me. Thought leadership, all right? Everyone air quoting. <laughs> thought leadership moves a lot faster than workplace reality. Mm -hmm. So you might go to an event and you see people talking at this conference about these new ideas. All right, a couple of years ago it was microlearning. But then you go back home and you're putting out the fires within your day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes, well, where am I? Am I behind in my organization? You know, is everyone else lapping me when it comes to these new ideas and, and ways to support? And I know how easy it is to get stuck in a bubble and really mm -hmm. only know what you know when it comes to your profession, even though there are plenty of other people out there trying to solve the exact same problems. When I worked at Disney, I had that experience where I was very good at what we did at Disney. But then when I left Disney, I realized, oh, there are other people who do this too. And I should talk to those people. So 
the whole hype cycle idea was, you know, how do I kind of put into a visual with some additional explanation? Where are we as a profession with these different topics, right? Mm. How much of this is still just hype where there's just a lot of conversation, but I haven't seen a lot of meaningful application and results from a conversation? Or where are we really figuring this out? Where as a profession, we've really mastered this topic. And if you're trying to figure out where you are, you can get kind of a benchmark of how evolved we are as a profession, just from a global perspective, um, when it comes to these kind of different popular or buzzy concepts out there. So on a, a twice annual basis, I update based on um, the least scientific research process you've probably ever seen, which is people I talk to and things I read, because fortunate or otherwise, this is all I do. So the great mm -hmm. thing about this podcast is you're stopping me from saying these words to people who live in my house. So <laughs> they would prefer not to hear me talk about micro learning. So thank you for giving me an outlet. But uh, so the, um, I don't even know where I was going with that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so I spend all of my time thinking about and reading, you know, all of the articles out there, publications, research mm -hmm. reports, things like that. And then For also sure. in my work with Exonify, talking with organizations in a variety of different industries at a global scale. So I take all of that insight that I'm just gathering on a regular basis and find ways to try to report it back out to the profession to help mm -hmm. people better understand topics like micro learning. So mm -hmm. the, the hype cycle is one of the ways that I try to do that. And then just kind of keep pace on what's real, what's hype, and where are we seeing real value just as a profession to help people bring these ideas into their own organizations. Now, Exonify recently released a research report on frontline work experience. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Every year we, we go out and we talk to the frontline workforce. And I think that's a critical part of the story because of how just underserved they tend to be in mm -hmm. a lot of industry conversations. And just to be frank, I've read a few articles in the past two years about the transition to working from home, right? And how many days should you work from home versus <laughs> work from an office mm -hmm. and all of those types of conversations. And in a mm -hmm. lot of cases, conversations about the future of work tend to be about me. And what I wholeheartedly believe and where a lot of my career comes from is that 80% of the global workforce is not me, mm -hmm. right? It's the people who could not go home. It's the mm -hmm. people who work in manufacturing fields, agriculture, food service, retail, mm -hmm. grocery, mm -hmm. healthcare, right? Those teams. And I, I believe they're underserved when it comes to conversations around how we evolve the workplace, how we evolve learning and development. So what my team at Exonify does as part of our focus on frontline employees is we go out every year and we talk to a, a large group of frontline employees around the world to get a sense of what is and is not working. So last year's report was very much focused on the beginning stages of the pandemic and how effectively were frontline employees being supported in the ways that things were transitioning. So we pulled a lot of information around right, how heavily impacted people were by furloughs, how they mm -hmm. were being communicated with uh, when they had to go home and didn't know if and when they'd be returning to work and those parts of the story. So a year later, we've evolved our, our conversation to be about the broader scope of frontline work, especially in the context of staffing shortages and the conversation around wage increases and all of the things that are happening directly impacting the frontline right now, in addition to the continued conversation around safety and engagement and, and customer interaction and all of those different things. So, so we went out we talked to frontline employees in the UK and Australia, in North America, and we asked them broad questions about how are they doing, right? How well are they supported? How, how are they seeing their opportunities evolve when it comes to work? Do they intend to stay in their jobs or have they already planned to leave? Why are they leaving? And we found out things like 45% of frontline employees have decided to leave. And the biggest reason cited for their departure is not compensation which is what tends to dominate the headlines, mm -hmm, sure. rightfully so, because it's a huge part of the conversation. But the number one cited reason was burnout. Compensation hmm. across the board was actually the fourth most cited reason for people's departure from frontline roles. So that allowed us to ask the question, well, how do we need to look at burnout on the frontline? How does that relate to themes like flexible working conditions when you can't go home for work? How does it relate to appreciation and the relationship frontline employees have with their manager, who in a lot of cases represents the company? Like we talk about, uh, there's a common meme out there where people will say, uh, employees don't leave jobs, they leave right. managers. Right. Yep. Which I think is a 
dramatic oversimplification of how <laughs> things work. And I'm sure everyone out there has left a job where you had a good manager, but there was another reason to leave. But mm -hmm. when you put it in the context of the front line, in a lot of cases, the company and the manager might be the same thing mm -hmm. because of your perspective and how that how that person influences your day-to-day -day working reality. So what we try to do in this report is take everything we learned by talking to frontline workers about their everyday working experience and then match that up with some case studies that we have, uh, some best practices or proven practices around how you can improve the working experience in addition to a lot of the levers we see organizations applying. So we see people increasing wages. We see things like hiring bonuses. People are changing the nature of work around things like automation, robotics, self-service is happening. We see a lot of organizations offering education benefits. And all mm -hmm. of those levers are great. But what we haven't seen a lot of yet is changes to the employee experience itself and what's causing people to leave, uh, what's creating the burnout, what's causing the staffing shortages and whatnot. And that's where we wanted to offer some assistance or insight into that part of the frontline experience, but do it directly from the front line, not just from people like me or the HR team or L&D team, all meaningful mm -hmm. stakeholders in the conversation. But it really starts with asking the frontline worker, how are you doing and what do you need? And that's what we hope our annual report provides. Yeah, that sounds like some great stuff. So if I want to get my hands on that research report, or if our audience wants to learn more about Exonify or LearnGeek, where should they go? Sure, a couple places. So first of all, uh, head over to exonify.com. If you click on the resources tab, that's where you're going to find our frontline report from this year, past years, as well as other great case studies and examples of how we're using a lot of the topics we talked about today, including mm -hmm. microlearning, to enable frontline workers in a variety of places around the world. And then from a Learn Geek perspective, the hype cycle we talked about um, mm -hmm. and other curated resources, presentations, whatnot, that's all available at learngeek.co. Uh, not .com, because I refuse to be held for ransom to that extent. So <laughs> learngeek.co is my uh -huh. website. And yep. then if anyone just has questions about this, uh, wants to dive in any more deeply to micro learning or anything else we've mentioned, feel free to contact or reach out to me directly. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, Just use my name, JD Dillon. I'm also JD underscore Dillon on Twitter. Uh, the one thing I will note is that if you Google JD Dillon, you're going to find two of us. One of us is an executive in the energy field. That is not me. Not you. I'm not in energy <laughs> yes. marketing. Right. Uh, I'm the learning and development one. So if you Google JD Dillon and then the word learning, you'll find me. Uh, feel free to reach out and connect. Happy to chat. All right. Just for clarity's sake, I want to let our listeners know that all of those links will be included in this episode's companion guide. So be sure to unlock that today at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. Right now, though, JD, it is time for our lightning round questions. And these are questions I like to ask of every guest of the podcast. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. So our first question is a topic showdown. In this episode, we've been talking about micro learning. In your opinion, JD, which of these small but powerful creatures is mightier? The ant who can carry up to 5,000 times its own weight or the bee who could fly up to 20 miles an hour? I got to give respect to the bee, but I'm going to go with the ant. Uh, <laughs> less because of my understanding of the animal kingdom and those dynamics and more because, uh, you know, I feel for the ant that gave his life for the children and honey, I shrunk the kids. So uh, respect like to Auntie um, as Very well as good. the entire Ant-Man franchise. Very good. I love it. What's the best book you've read recently? It's sitting next to me and is awkwardly well-timed to this conversation. <laughs> it's called The Burnout Epidemic by oh, an author yes. named Jennifer Moss yes. that, that my team has had a lot of great conversation with around really helping organizations understand that burnout's not a personal problem, it's an organizational problem, and it's more about how we design work and less about uh, the individual experience of work. Absolutely. And you might be surprised to learn that we had Jennifer Moss on Project HR just a couple of episodes ago, um, talking all go. about the burnout epidemic. So yeah, so her, her, that's very timely. Uh, all right, next question. What is your favorite thing about the work you do? I'm in learning and development for all of the altruistic reasons and not for the money, surprisingly enough. <laughs> so... For me, it, it really goes back to my first day and my first job. Uh, I do this for a living because as a 17-year-old who was very shy, and I don't even know how I managed to get a job that involved working with the public and why I thought that was a great idea, but I remember how scared I was to do this. Um, I, I think I was a pretty smart kid, but I was very concerned about, I, had to, I was a cashier, so I had to count money, never handled cash before talk mm -hmm. to strangers, take mm -hmm. orders, all these things I was very unfamiliar with. And there was a, a guy named Tommy who was my age, who was senior to me in the organization. And he was my, he was my trainer. 
And he managed to, in a couple of days, get me over that fear and really shift the perspective that I had about the role that good training plays in helping people not just be knowledgeable and ha have the right skills in the job, but have the confidence to be mm -hmm. able to do your best work every day. So I constantly reflect back to that first job experience I had, and that mm -hmm. informs a lot of what I do today. So my favorite thing is the fact that I, I think we can not just help organizations be successful as learning and development, but help people be proud of the work that they do every day, be confident in that work, and you know, go home feeling good about going to work the next day. What a great story, I love that. So tell me, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I feel like I had an answer to this question and now it's, <laughs> it's completely escaping me. Uh, I'm gonna have to noodle this uh, for, for a second because I, I feel like I shared it in a, in a meeting recently, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna default to the, the stock answer for this one. And it comes from a, a very intelligent scientist named Dr. Emmett Brown, very popular <laughs> in the 80s. And he once said that roads where we're going, we don't need roads. And the only reason I said that is because we talked about memory earlier. And uh -huh. if anyone would ever need some entertainment, I can mm -hmm. recite all of the lines from Back to the Future. And nice. a wall of my home office is entirely Back to the Future fan art. So right. when in doubt, just just go back to the future. Some, some good words of wisdom there. No, I like it. That is excellent advice. All right, last question. Who or what inspires you? I have a feeling it might be tied to the last answer. <laughs> Uh, it's it's not. I could I okay. could go the Marty McFly route, but really, was Marty <laughs> McFly really that all? He did not have his stuff together. <laughs> this um, is true. Was, you don't really. I don't think you want to be him. I'm gonna <laughs> go uh, with again. This might be a common answer right now, given the past two years. But I'm going with the frontline workforce, mm -hmm. just because of what people have have had to face as the workplace and the challenges they've been dealing with have evolved over the past two years. And specifically the connection that they've had to, to me and what I've been able to do or how I've been able to take care of myself and those around me as a result of their work. So mm. some of my favorite interactions over the past two years have been via text message with people in grocery stores that are picking groceries for me. <laughs> and just the level, like the mm -hmm. fact that I remember those conversations and mm -hmm. that they, you know, I, I know what they were dealing with just because of what I do for a living, but the fact that they were able to have that much level of engagement and make it fun mm -hmm. in a time that was clearly not fun for people. Mm -hmm. So the, the fact that they've been able to allow me to take care of my own, you know, environment by going out there every day and, and facing it, you know, they already did difficult jobs before 2020 and it just mm -hmm. became that much harder. So mm -hmm. again, kind of coming back to why do I do what I do and why am I passionate about the work my team at Exonify does is I wholeheartedly believe the frontline workforce deserves the best we can provide when it comes to enabling them to, to do a great job and be proud of the job that they do. And they're a constant source of inspiration for me and my team when it comes to finding the best ways that we can help. Yeah, that is absolutely inspirational. Thanks so much for joining me today on this week's episode of Project HR, JD. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks, too, to our listeners. Once again, this is your reminder to grab the companion guide for this episode at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. And if you'd like to be on Project HR or know someone who would, feel free to email us at projecthr at projectionsinc.com. And last, but certainly not least, make sure you never miss an episode of Project HR. I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast. Drop us a line, leave us a review, or give us a handful of stars wherever you get your content. That's it for me for now. Let's make it a great day at work.